have to hear this from me. Uh, it, it is an honor to get to know your staff, the leadership here. They are authentic. They're, they're people of God. They're pursuing the Lord. And they have a heart to see the, the city and the surrounding cities changed and transformed for Jesus Christ. I'm pumped up. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to see all that God wants to do in and through you. I believe that God has a plan for your life. I'm here on behalf of my pastors, Pastor Peter and Carolyn Haas, all the way from Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're a part of ARC, the Association of Related Churches. My, you, you, your church is a part of that as well. We were ARC church plant number 15, and my pastors helped lead at ARC. And so it's just an honor to be here. I'm a, I'm a good friend, I would say a great friend of Pastor Daryl. Can we give it up for Pastor Daryl? If you know him and you love him. I see you in the back. We're family, bro. We're fam I'm Italian. My last name's Puccini. We're Italian here. So we, we're family now. You're family for life. You are in the family. Can I show you a quick photo of my family? My wife, is she is so hot. I'd love to put this up. My wife there and my beautiful kids. Been married 19 years. Have two children. Just celebrated 19 years last week. Come on, we've been together 22 years. Just love my family. Uh, I'll just tell you a story. I, I never forget the, the first time I bought my first brand new car. And as, you, uh, as you know, a new car, it has this new car smell. It's actually just this beautiful aroma. It's actually chemicals that will kill you, but it smells so good. And I just remember my car being shiny and being beautiful. And I, I, I'd always had hand-me-down cars up until I bought my first new car. And I was so excited about it. And uh, I remember in the first week that I owned it, I actually uh, backed out of my garage and smashed into this large uh, dumpster and just destroyed the back end of my brand new car. It was just completely unbelievable. I owned it three days and completely totaled my car. I remember my second new car in the first week I owned it, I got in an accident and it ripped the front end of my car off. It was a beautiful brand new car. I remember my third new car and, and I pulled up to my friend's house and there was a, a hot water heater in his yard. It was one of those friends and uh, I, I, I just ripped the bumper off my car somehow. I don't know what happened. And, and you may at this point think, well, this dude is a pretty bad driver. Actually, I'm super obsessed with uh, keeping my car perfectly clean. You may know, know these people. Pastor Daryl is one of these people. You get in the car and everything is meticulous, like it looks like it's still from the dealership. I have these little fine tooth combs that every stoplight, I brush the dust off of my, anybody annoyed by the dust in the car? I, I have little kids, I don't let them ride in my car. Uh, I just get the Cheerios smashed down into the seat and into the crevices and the places. So kids, no kids in my my car, my car is perfect. I get all the dust. Here, you got so much sand everywhere. There's just sand all over the cars. And I would clean my car obsessively. And so, it, it, listen, I'm obsessed with taking care of things. But on my fourth new car, it was a, a minivan. Come on, minivan owners in the room. Can I hear from you? Riding, you, you know this is the most practical vehicle in the world, but it's a minivan. And I remember getting that minivan in the first day that I owned it, my wife smashed into a recycling bin and busted the tailgate. On my fifth new car, I was at a restaurant and a dude backed into the side of my car and smashed both doors in. On my sixth new car, uh, I had this brand new beautiful SUV and the first week I owned it, uh, a large shell fell off a trailer in front of me in a storm and smashed the front end. And at some point you, in this story, you might be thinking, dude, you're pretty wealthy having all these new cars. Well, I actually was before I became a pastor, but listen, this is still, that's supposed to be funny. This is still frustrating. I, I, listen, I just wanted to have a new car. I wanted it to be in perfect shape. I didn't want to, this thing I paid all this money for to, to be damaged. I just wanted one year of that perfect new car smell and my kids get in the car and it smells like Cheetos. I, I just wanted my car to be nice, is that too much to ask for? See, on my seventh new car, I was backing out of the garage and I ripped the mirror off the, the side mirror as I began to back out. So finally, a few months ago, I, I bought my, my dream car. I bought uh, uh, this beautiful big truck, all black on black, black rims. It has backup cameras, sensors all around it. It's this beautiful, all leather sunroof. It's just that manly truck that you want to drive. And I finally got a truck, and I'm not going to haul anything in it or let people borrow it to move. It's my truck. 
It's made to look good. It's fully decked out. I mean, it, it was so decked out. It, it came with a drone that flies over it to keep me safe and, and away from harm. Uh, so I remember sitting at the dealership and I, I'm sitting there and I, I just, I have this conversation with myself and, and I just like, you have to take care of this car. You have to protect this investment. In the next few years, this car is going to look exactly how it looks right now. And so I, I remember just like it leaving the dealership and it was like, I was uh, taking driver's ed all over again. My hands are on 10 and two. I'm driving 10 miles under the speed limit. Yes, I am that guy. You need to go around me. I'm going to take care of this car. I remember checking all my blind spots as I drive home, checking my mirrors every three seconds. And and just so happened that that weekend, my sister-in-law came to town to visit us, and I parked my brand new truck in my garage. It just barely fit, and she happened to park just a little off center behind me, and I needed to get up at 5 a.m. to go to church the next morning because I'm such a spiritual man of God. I wake up early and divine and have my conversations with the Lord, just like all your pastors do. And so I, I was dark outside, and I, I needed to back my car up out of the garage and I see her car is just off center. Well, I'm a very skilled driver, people, and I knew that I could get my car out of that garage without hitting her car. Anybody ever done this? You're like this far apart from another car. Be like, listen, I got this. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making the cut, I'm getting out of the garage and uh, everything looks good, my mirrors are good, the backup camera's working and I'm paying attention to that backup camera as I begin to leave the garage. And all of a sudden I hear the loudest scratching metal sound. I've never heard anything like this. It sounded like a pterodactyl being eaten by a hippopotamus. It was just this horrible metal sound gash and, and, and the, this, this metal rail in my garage gashed the largest four foot gash all along the side of my brand new truck that I had bought the day before damaging all the doors and the side panels. And as you listen to this story, maybe this is like, it just feels like this is a metaphor for your whole life. I, I wanna ask you today, have you ever felt completely out of control? Some of you are like that, the story of your cars is kinda like the story of my whole last year. Maybe you're here today, maybe it's not a vehicle, maybe it's your reputation. Maybe it just feels like life is out of control. Maybe it's situations with your family. Maybe it's your physical body. Maybe it's shame in your life that you haven't dealt with. Maybe it's, it's some issue that you feel up against. Maybe you lost your job. You feel uh, discouraged in this season of life, feeling like there's just no purpose for who I am. But I'm here to tell you today that God can reverse your fortunes just like this. We see in Psalms 145, 16, he, he opens up his hands and satisfies the desires of every living thing. Listen, church, it is nothing for God to show up and meet you. And you may ask the question, well, how? Church, listen, God is not looking for perfect. He is simply looking for promotable. And I promise he's not looking for striving. He's simply looking for an act of surrender. And listen, if we could just rid ourselves today, and I'm gonna invite you into this, to rid ourselves of the need to control everything all the time. I actually believe that God is gonna take you on a ride that you will never forget, amen? Amen, and here's what I believe about right now. I believe that in this room, online, whatever campus you are at, that God is actually setting up a miracle story for your life. You may think that this year has just been a waste. The last two years have been so discouraging. And I actually believe today that God is bringing a miracle to you. I actually believe today that this may be your best year ever. Many people aren't saying that right now. With all the discouragement, all the, the things that are happening in our world, how could this be our best year? I actually believe that this could be your best year if it's your best year spiritually. Amen? Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that we can get into your word, that we can gather together in these moments, however we're getting here. And we come before you, Lord, and I, I just pray this, that you would just give us ears to hear and hearts that are receptive to receive your word today. Because you have word, a word that is in season for our lives to impart life, hope, freedom, and purpose. I believe that, Holy Spirit, you are going to release peace and joy in this room that no circumstance in this world can bring, that only you can bring. And so we receive that right now, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen? Amen, hey, listen, I actually, I grew up a pastor's kid. Any PKs in the house? I grew up a pastor's kid, and so there were seven of us. I, I, from six weeks old on, I was at church 
three times a week. We had Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Anybody with me? I was at church all the time. In fact, I was kind of a church rat. I had heard all the sermons you could ever hear. In fact, I used to take a table knife from the church kitchen. I'd break into the Sunday school rooms and steal all the candy on Saturday night. And uh, I'm a horrible person. I'm just confessing that to you, God, right now. I would steal food from the, the food pantry. It just sounds horrible. I remember crawling under the pews in church. My dad called me out, and we were going to get in trouble after service. And just, uh, you know, I grew up in church culture. I grew up around church people, and I'd been in endless worship environments. I did all the missions trips, the camps, and the conventions. In fact, every Sunday when I was, uh, I would show up as a teenager because I was so spiritual, I would put my Bible right next to me so no girl could get between me and Jesus. That's, that's kind of how I, I interacted with church. I remember getting into, uh, I was 18 years old and, and some things happened in church and some horrible things were done to my parents by people in the church. And, uh, and who knows that church people can hurt people and, I, I just, and hurting people hurt people. And I, I just remember them doing some things that were just so hurtful and they just, they marked my life and they, they created some fear in my life and some bitterness in my life because people are people and, and just these things happened in my life that were just so hurtful and harmful by the church. And I, I remember uh, kind of moving on into my career and, and just so happened at a very young age, I, I was very successful in, in my career. I went into business uh, and, and actually by age 25, I actually became ex extremely successful and I began to move up the corporate ladder. I was overseeing a five state region for a fast growing company. By age 26, I made my first million dollars it's a lot of money, right? Made my first million dollars, a lot of money for a 26 year old and began to uh, take that money, save it and I launched my own business. Uh, soon I owned uh, 17 stores over a whole entire state, retail locations. We were doing about 17 to $20 million a year in revenue and uh, I became very successful in myself and I had turned away from the church. The church had hurt me. The church was not for me anymore. I was just became kind of this, this bitter person. And, and listen, on paper, I was successful. On paper, I, I was recognized and, and promoted. I'd be in the newspaper. I was a top selling company in the whole entire Midwest for the company that, that I sponsored. And, I, and, the, and I, I was a big deal, by the way. I was pretty much a big deal. My family in ministry, they, they were all pastors at this time. And they would look at me and be like, man, we're in ministry. And it's just so hard to be in ministry. But Nate, he's successful. He's got all these stores. He's made it in life. The dark truth in my story was I was actually suffering from a 10-year eating disorder. I had secret shame struggles in my life, secret sins that I had buried deep that no one knew about, things that I just hid from. I, I, the shame was this, this, this monster that just polluted my mind, and I, I just never dealt with it, and I never confessed it to anyone. I just hid it, and it just kept reinforcing itself, and the shame would reinforce itself, and the shame would reinforce itself, and I lived in this guilt cycle. My marriage, it was, it was barely in maintenance mode. I, I, I didn't care if I lost my marriage or not. I was a workaholic. I'd work 14, 15 hours a day, seven days a week, and I, I just literally couldn't get enough of it. It was a, an obsession of me. I was obsessed with the next opportunity. And honestly, I had no accountability in my life. I was so, I just remember that moment so vivid right now. It was, I was so lonely. And to be really honest, I, I just lacked anything in my life and I, that, that would actually help me overcome this. And I was so miserable. The isolation would torment me. I remember just laying at night and just like, I just wish someone would see me. I wish someone would notice me. I wish someone would acknowledge me. I wish someone would reach out to me. And no one ever did. No text, no phone call. Unless they wanted a free, free, you know, free item from my store or something from me. Everything felt transactional. People just wanted things from me. No one reached out to say, how are you really doing? I actually became really bitter at God. I became very angry at the church. And I even questioned if God was real or not. And, and if he was real, was it even important to my life? Man, I was a mess. It was hard because uh, my Christian family, they just looked at me and they promoted the success in my life. They bragged about how successful I was. And I was just sitting there and I just, I just wished someone would reach out and say, listen, you're loved and you're cared for and there's a plan for your life and there's purpose for you. But no one ever did until this guy, Chad. 
Chad saw me, and I remember a day with Chad, and I just told him my pain, and, 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 and Chad said, man, dude, I, I see that you're hurting, and I just, would you go to church with me? I, I don't know necessarily the answers to everything you're going through, or even what to say to you, but I go to this church, would you go to church, and I'll take you to lunch? And it met in this high school, and it was like crazy. It was like dark auditorium, and there was a DJ on stage, and there was a guy rapping. And I'm like, where am I at? Is this a nightclub? But it was 9 a.m. on Sunday, and I'm like, all these people are happy. And I came in the parking lot, and people are waving flags in my face. And people were really nice when I walked in, and I'm like, where, are they on drugs? Where did they get all this caffeine? This is crazy, you know, caffeine, the Christian drug of choice. And so I, I, I came into the church and everyone was friendly to me and they just, they just saw me. And, I, he, and this guy, Chad, kept inviting me back to this church called Substance. He'd show up, he'd meet me every Sunday in the lobby. He'd sit with me and then he'd take me to lunch afterwards. And I was that guy sitting eight rows back in this side of the auditorium with my arms crossed, just staring down the pastor, criticizing everything they did at the church. But over time of showing up, I began to soften and, and become more open to what I was hearing in that, ser that service. And soon after in that, that process, there was this 21-year-old intern in the church. Her name was Grace. Grace always remembered my name. She never forgot my name. And, and I, I was checking my kids into kids' ministry, and I checked them in, and, and she just really said, hey, Puccinis, I'm so excited you're here. And Grace invited my, fam my wife and I to come serve in kids' ministry. And it was the first person to make an invitation at church for me to serve with them. And that invitation began to lead to a deeper transformation in my life. There was this guy named Daniel. He'd hang out in the lobby, and... He, he asked me to come attend his small group with me, and he's, I'm still friends with him today, and began to get accountability in my life. And at that group, that small group, I met a guy named Bill, and he, he said, you want to meet on Monday and get tacos together and just pray together, because you know all great things happen over tacos, amen? And we began to, to meet together, and, and then this other guy said, hey, let's get together on Thursday nights and just have accountability together and just deal with stuff in our life as men together. Soon after, this guy named Pastor Peter Haas, who is the lead pastor of our church, he saw me and he began to mentor me and pour into my life. And over time, he invited me to serve on his church board and use my experience in business to help the church. And during that time, there was a guy named Jeff who saw leadership in me and he called me out to be a leader in a small group. After that, there was a guy named Jordan and he called me out to come together with other pastors and grow in my leadership. And soon after that, there was a guy named Bart. Bart was physically in shape and healthy, and he said, hey, man, I do these triathlons. You want to do triathlons with me and get physically in shape because he, you can't be spiritually healthy and not be physically healthy, and so would you do those things with me? Began to do triathlons together, and we did five triathlons and began to get mentorship in my life, people speaking into my life, and after that, a guy named Peter, the pastor, came back to me and says, I, I know there's a deeper calling on your life for ministry. I want to call it out and see you come to the place that God has for you. And get this, after years of building connectivity and accountability, relationships and spiritual growth, I, I, I burned my plow, I sold my business, I went all into the ministry and went all after Jesus. And I want to share this today. I want you to catch this. For my life, there was a series of invitations that led to a complete transformation. I went from isolation to wholeness. And the reason why I share this story with you today, because I actually believe it illustrates a principle of transformation that a lot of Christians are actually missing in their lives. A lot of people think that church services are God's primary tool for transforming lives. It is a lie and deceit we fall into as Christians. But the Bible teaches us it's actually fellowship. It's intimate Christian community that truly heals us. We, for example, we see in James 5, 16, and check this scripture out with me. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. It's the prayer of a righteous man that is powerful and effective. You see here, we, we see healing is a result of confession and prayer, not just to God, but to other Christians. And I just wondered today, how many people lack true healing in their life because they lack horizontal confession of sin? 
For me, as as an immature believer in my life, thinking I had it all figured out because I was a pastor's kid that grew up in the religion of going to church, I, I actually knew I was so mature and I had it all figured out. I was hoping that God would just simply take my issues away from some sermon podcast or some altar experience. Otherwise, it would just be too embarrassing for me to uh, submit my, my struggles to anybody else. And let's be honest, it's, it, it actually did not ever change. It actually just drove me into further isolation. Growing up, I was hoping that just maybe another tear-filled worship service would actually do the trick in my life. Perhaps I just needed to read another book or, or memorize another scripture. But, but let's get honest here. What I really needed was confession of sin, true accountability in my life. Amen? We, we see all throughout scripture, we see it in James and 1 Peter, and we see it in the Psalms and actually 15 different other references where, where scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, right? We believe that. But guess what the, 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 the key ingredient is? And, and just take a while, guess The key ingredient to humility is humiliation. It's the ability to actually experience hum, humiliation. Or I would say it like this. It's the willingness to experience humiliation. It was actually pretty embarrassing to sh- share my secret sins with other people. But it was the access of removing shame from my life that led me to true freedom. For my life, I I wanted to believe that knowledge was my biggest problem growing up. Well, think about it. Is knowledge usually our issue? Usually usually it's not. For example, let me share this with you. We all know we should eat healthy, right? We know that. We all know we should eat spinach and kale. That equals good. Brits donuts equals bad. I had three yesterday. We all know that we should be reading our Bible and we should be praying and and we should be working out every day. But are these the disciplines of our life? Are they? Let me point this out. Knowledge is not always the problem. Rather, it's accountability. It's realness. It's it's, it's prayer with other people. You need friends. And I I got this in my life finally. You need friends that could look you in the eye and say, How are you really doing? Let me help you. Let me help you. My breakthrough in life was actually the application of God's scripture. It was not just having knowledge in my heart. I finally had spiritual friends that could get in my life and take a brave step with me. And and, and in doing this, I spilled my soul. And over the next several years, I experienced amazing amounts of healing in my life. Because of that healing and that process of uh, what I, I, I felt like a place of joy and a, a place of freedom and a place of restoration, who could use more joy in this room today? Who could use more freedom in this room today? Who needs peace in their life? And, and I went through this process. I, I, I began to just kind of come up with this, this principle, and I'd love to share this with you today. You'll see it on the screen. I call it the humiliation principle. The degree to which you are willing to humiliate yourself is the degree to which God's grace is dispensed in your life. Or to say it another way, you rise to the level of your own humiliation. And listen, I'm not talking about being silly and being immature, but I I do think this, if you're willing to get authentic about the things you struggle with, I promise you, and I'm inviting you into that faith step today, I promise you, God responds. God responds. It kind of reminds me, in scripture we see this story in Luke 5, and uh, it's the story of the paralytic man. We've heard this story, and Jesus heals him. And as we look at this story, what's happening here in, in Luke 5, 17, is Jesus was actually teaching at Peter's house in Capernaum. The house was so full of people. No one could get in or out of the house. People just gathered around Jesus. He, who, who knows? There's something infectious about Jesus Christ. There's something that makes people want to come to him. I actually believe there's power and authority in the name Jesus. He has a plan and purpose for each and every one of you. And people would come around him, he would heal the sick, he would be teaching that the kingdom of God is coming. Well, outside this house, there was this paralyzed man and there was no way for this paralyzed man to get in and out of the house. And, and so he had friends that started suddenly digging through the roof and started lowering him before Jesus. I mean, how, how many would freak out if someone cut a hole in this roof and just started lowering a man down right now in this moment? I don't know about you, in Minnesota, we call that vandalism, that's illegal. And so finally they lowered the friend down before Jesus. And listen, instead of rebuking the men for destroying another man's property, Jesus actually healed their paralytic friend. But here's the point. I I believe many times we look at this story and we highlight the paralytic healing. 
But I, I'd like to highlight another section of that story. I actually think this story may be about the friends of the paralytic man. I mean, think about it. It takes a lot of guts to rip through another man's roof to see your friends healed and made whole. How many of you here would do something illegal in your life to see your friend healed? Put your hand up with me. How many in this room today would do something illegal just for fun? We have prayer available for you later. And so, <laughs> as I think about this, but seriously, listen, everyone. These guys love their friends so much that they would do anything to see their friend whole. And I remember when I first heard this story, I read this scripture, I, I felt like the Lord speak to me. That is what church is all about. Do you have friends that would rip through a roof for you? And ever since reading that, I, I just thought about, I, I just felt like the Lord said to me, Nate, that is what I intended my church to be. I, I, don't, I don't merely think of church anymore as just worship experiences or Bible teachings, and all of those are so great and so important. But I do think about this. I think about righteous community. I think about a group of friends who would go crazy out of their way to see you healed and made whole. And guess what? I want to share this with you. It's kind of crazy. Uh, statistics actually confirm this approach to church. Check this out. The number one statistical predictor of spiritual growth is actually how many intimate Christian friends that you have at any given moment in your life more than services attended, more than scriptures memorized, more than any other spiritual discipline. Intimate Christian community equals transformation. Listen, you can take two people and teach them the same quantity of God's word, but the one that has more intimate spiritual friends is more likely to apply that word in their life. It's, and we see that in James, just like I shared, when righteous people get together and have honest confession and prayer, what is it? It is powerful and it is effective. And, and what's crazy about this, uh, it, it doesn't actually, benefit, intimate supportive friends don't only benefit you spiritually, but physically as well. Research also shows that uh, isolation is one of the, the, the quickest ways to shorten your life expectancy. Did you know that? For example, did you know that your odds of surviving cancer, heart disease, and stroke literally doubles based on how many intimate supportive friends you have in your life? Isn't that crazy? In fact, a lack of social relationships jeopardizes coronary health to a degree that rivals cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, blood lipids, obesity, and lack of physical exercise. I mean, wow. So you're telling me uh, as long as I have some close intimate friends, I can be an obese chain smoker? Well, probably not. But ironically, medical research says socially isolated people are four times more susceptible to the common cold than those who have active social networks. It's, it's insane. Maybe God actually knew what he was doing to put us in relationship with other people. Research found that people with strong social ties have a 400% immune system advantage over isolated people. And what I'm saying here is isolation, I, I just want you to hear this church, lean in with me here. Isolation has serious risks. God did not design us to do life alone. He designed us for intimacy with other peoples. He's designed us to be together in righteous community. We are not Zoom calling into heaven. It's a physical reality where we're with people. He has called us to be in relationship together to grow in our faith, to get set free from the addictions and shame that has held us down, to step into true freedom and church without connectivity with other people. I, I want you to hear this today. I, I, I truly believe that healing and wholeness are always going to feel elusive in our lives. At some point, we are gonna need to return to God's solution. We need the biblical prescription of what healing really is. And it's, it's the church, it's, it's confession of sin, it's, it's, it's praying with other righteous people. And uh, after all that we've been through the, the last 18 months, we can naively just think that, that somehow isolated people are just gonna go back to normal. But I guarantee you this, there are tens of millions of people that are gonna be staying in isolation because that is the deceit of the enemy and what he wants them to do. He knows it will kill them. There are millions of Christians that are saying, you know, I'm just gonna watch online and never connect into community. I'm never gonna get into a small group. I'm never gonna get on a dream team. I'm never gonna go through connect. I'm never gonna take a next step. I feel like God sent me here today to give you a personal invitation into transformation. I believe that God has purpose and provision for your life. Listen, I don't think we fulfill James 5.16 by disengaging from church. And, and, and I get it. 
For my life, it wasn't circumstances in this world. It was a cynical heart, to be honest with you. But listen, I needed an invite back. I needed friendship. I needed ownership. I needed intimacy with other people. I needed to slide down the slippery creek bank of transformation that we see in James 5.16. And I believe that there are hundreds, if not thousands of people that you have connections with if it's not your own life, other people that need an invitation to be planted in physical church. We need to create opportunity for people to get connected into their healing. Amen? Amen. There's one last story to demonstrate this today. I heard this story a long time ago about this woman, a Jamaican woman. She lived in the island of Jamaica with these little kids. And just like a lot of moms, she had three little kids that they were all under the ages of five. And she was busy with the feeding cycles and diapers and the busyness of life. We've all been there. I mean, just like when you have little kids, it's like everything goes chaotic. And so she was raising her little kids. And while she was taking care of these three little kids one day and a friend was over with her, she all of a sudden fell over in a paralytic stroke. She's laying on the floor and she's completely, her eyes are just wide open, her tongue's hanging out. Her friend's standing there and they know that there's no medical care in, in the area. There's no doctors and she didn't she literally didn't know what to do the three kids are asking what happened to my mommy and, and 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 the friend began to panic and she ran and got a few other friends and brought them over to the house and, and no one literally knew what to do in the moment no one could help her but one friend had an idea he says well listen i i have a wheelbarrow what if we put her in the wheelbarrow and we get her somewhere and another friend said well i heard about this preacher that's preaching on, uh, on a town just several villages away. He's preaching on a stage in a service, and apparently some people have been healed there. What if we actually put her in the wheelbarrow, and we wheeled her over to that church, and we, we, we got her prayed for, and, and they're like, okay, that's the best idea we have. And they, they put blankets in the wheelbarrow, and they began to lay her, her comatose, lifeless body in that wheelbarrow, and they began the trek of several miles to get her to this church. It was late at night when they got there and church service is going on and people are listening to a pastor and the back door is open in this metal building and the friends are there with her crying, the children are with her. She's laying there lifeless, comatose. They begin to wheel her straight down the aisle as the pastor is preaching and brought her up front and they just literally set her in front of the preacher. And they said, would you pray for our friends? Would you pray for our friend? Would you pray for our friend? We need to see her healed. Her little kids need her. Her little kids need her. The pastor's so moved by their faith, so moved by how crazy you would disrupt a service. You would interrupt everything that's happened. He was so moved by that moment that he looked down at Vita and he said, in the name of Jesus, stand up and be healed. Every place, the whole place was on pins and needles. Everyone was leaning in. The place was so quiet. Nothing happened. People began to weep around the auditorium. The friends are standing there crying and the pastor in faith said it again, in the name of Jesus, stand up and be healed. And all of a sudden, the whole room heard this deep breath and eyes open and Vita stood up, completely healed and made whole. Come on, we can celebrate the miraculous work of God. So I thought about this story, thought about my own life, I thought about how in many ways my own life was paralyzed. And in my own way, my life was just arrested and, and, and not even be able to communicate what was wrong with me, not even be able to communicate the needs that I truly have. I, I actually was that paralyzed woman. I was that paralyzed friend that couldn't get before Jesus. And, I, and I'm thinking about this story, oh, to have friends like Vita McKenzie. Listen, a lot of people divine success in this world by their bank accounts. And I, I just urge you, church, so many people define their success by what they possess and their jobs and their circumstances. But I urge you, church, to think about this. I actually believe it's Christian fellowship. I, I think it's kind of like the story of the paralyzed man in Luke 5. He simply could not get to Jesus. But he had friends that were willing to dig through a roof to see him healed. And so I ask you this question boldly today. Do you have friends that would rip through a roof for you? Do you have friends that would take your lifeless, comatose body, put it in a wheelbarrow and get you before Jesus to see you healed and made whole? Because if you can't give me an affirmative yes, then for all practical purposes, you're an unchurched Christian. 
You can attend all the church services you want and still lack the transformational relationships that bring true joy. And listen, God did not design us to merely attend a church service. He did not design us to become some superficial Bible experts with no relationships. God wants us to be a part of a community that will see each of us through to wholeness. And that's what I believe that Life Point Church is all about. We are a family. We are a family. We're a family that fights for each other. We're a family that goes out of our way and inconveniences ourselves for the sake of other people. We talk all the time about what it means to reach on church people and miss the very question, do we ourselves even know what it means to be churched? I mean, listen, it's the blood of Christ that heals, amen? We sing songs about it, but the blood flows through the body of Christ. And who is that body? You are, you are the body. And simply not enough to have superficial relationships anymore with people. And just that just happen to be Christians, maybe, just happen to attend, attend the same church service. It, it has to be real. If we don't have enough intimacy and vulnerability to confess our sins on a regular basis, then the very, we're missing the very foundation of biblical teaching. So right now, I have this sense that some of you in this room today, and they're just areas of your life you simply haven't been dealing with. I actually think that God may be calling some of you to get with someone today. And I'm actually gonna give you a challenge. At some point today, it doesn't need to be in this room, but at some point today, get with another person that you trust and confess your sins to them. And others of you in this room, maybe you just feel like, like I did. Maybe you're that isolated, bitter millionaire sitting eight rows back in a service with no connection and no relationship and no accountability and you haven't been vulnerable with your life and you simply are confused and desperate for help. Listen to me, church. God can do anything. And right now, if you simply reach out to him, I believe that many of you are gonna experience a miracle right in this moment. Wherever you're at, listening online, at that campus or in this room, I believe that God has a miracle for you. I believe some of you in, in this room today that you need to actually accept Jesus into your life and have a personal relationship with him. I believe that joy and peace is found in the simple act of surrender. I think some of you in this room, one more, you have great Christian community. You have great relationships with other believers but I believe that God is calling you to see isolated, lonely people and invite them into a place of true transformation. I believe that you are the access to their healing. I believe right now that God brought you to Life Point this weekend to experience his power. So if you would, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, in the moment of just trusting God with our life. Maybe you're the person that needs to accept Jesus into your heart. Maybe you're a person who needs to step out of isolation into transformation and deal with shame issues in your life, secret sin struggles, whatever it is. Maybe you connected with my story as a 10 year eating disorder. It just locked me out. There was no freedom in my life. Maybe you connected with the part of being isolated and lonely, whatever it is for you. I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to meet you right where you're at. We serve a God who loves you and cares for you. I believe in this room, online, wherever you're listening, it's time for a reset for many people. You've lived far from God, you've isolated yourself on purpose, and God is calling you to make a reset. God is calling you to take a step into ownership today. Whatever it is for you, let's just, in your own way, in your own heart, let's just pray, pray to God and pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you that in this time, in this moment, we, don't, we can't do anything to earn you. We, we can't do anything to achieve you, but you freely give yourselves unto us. And I believe right now that there are supernatural miracles that are being released in this room right now. I believe relationships are being set up, that people are being invited out of isolation into wholeness. I believe there are people that are far from you that are coming into relationship with you right now. And if that's you and you, you just know that you need to have a reset in your life or you need to accept Jesus as your savior, I just want you to just right now say, Lord, I simply receive you in your own way, in your own heart. And I believe that he's gonna speak to you and you're gonna see a miracle take place in your life. 
So Lord, I just pray a blessing over every single person that can hear my voice right now, that today is a marked day. The old is behind us, the new is ahead of us. We are made whole in you, Christ Jesus, and the church of God will, will prevail and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. That Wilmington and the surrounding areas are gonna be taken for Jesus. That Wilmington will be known as a Jesus city because men and women of God have stepped into the gap, have stepped into a place of helping others, fight for others, get to others so they can get healed and made whole. God, I speak that over this church and this church future in Jesus' name. Maybe that's you with every head bowed and you, made, you prayed that prayer. I just, I need to accept Jesus into my heart. I need a reset. I'm far from him. I haven't been living for him and I just need to decide to follow him today. If you would, no one looking around, would you just put your hand up right now? We see you, God sees you, he loves you, he knows you, he's got a plan for your life. We're so thankful for the decision, the response to Christ in Jesus' name. Can we give it up for everybody that made that decision to follow Jesus?